coming up next on the breadwinning mums. You, you can do it. You, you're determined. You're resilient. Um, you know, you know you. So take it one day at a time, and know that everything will work out and everything will be okay. Welcome to the show. I'm Jane Lim. On the Breadwinning Mums podcast, we debunk the myths of working mums, cheer each other on, and show the world that it's okay to be a mum and still pursue excellence in your chosen area of expertise. Today we're chatting with my sister, Yanti Ropian, a fellow breadwinning mum with one baby son, Ilo. Yanti is a proud Ankamuti, Yadai Kenu, Wupabara, Meriam woman from far north Cape York Peninsula. She shared with us her life story about growing up with her mob, battling her sexuality and overcoming depression before finally coming out to her family and finding love whilst giving back to her community. Here we go with Yanti Ropia. Hello, Yanti. How are you going, sis? I'm good, sis. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. So, obviously, we know each other from our MBA study that we have just finished from AGSM. Um, yes. But for most of us, uh, all of the breadwinning moms, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you came from, and how you came to be where you are? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I'm Yanti. I'm originally from Ingenue in Cape York, small Aboriginal community. I am a librarian by profession, and so I've been working at uh, James Cook University for the last four years before going on sabbatical and meeting you mm -hmm. uh, during the yeah the 2023 cohort. So, um, and yeah, so and just now, just going into teaching, and I guess making it to your podcast as a mom. So. Yeah, big congrats! Yeah. A lot of Thank milestones you. over the last twelve months. Um, so take us take us back to the really young Yanti. Then, did you always know that you were going to be a mom? Uh, actually, no. I I never thought I would actually be a mom, only because I've you know grown up you know with you know, surrounded by family, lots of cousins. So all of my siblings, they started, you know, having family, you know, really, really young. And I never thought it would be an option for me. I thought I would just be that really cool auntie that, you know, takes the kids for a few hours, gives mom and dad, you know, reprieve, and then I can just hand them back over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, no, I never thought I would be a mom. And, and that's when everything changed when I met my beautiful wife, Jo. And, you know, we discussed you know, the possibility of having kids, but also myself, um, not, I don't think I could, I'm not the type that would probably carry only because I'm a little bit chicken when it comes to pain <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> yeah, just a little bit so I was just like no babe I, I won't be able to do it you have to do it <laughs> and she did it and she did it with flying colors so and now we have a beautiful four-month-old who's absolutely changed my world so I never thought the joy would you know I would feel um yeah despite being sleep deprived, but you know, it's part of the journey, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's awesome. How would you elaborate if you were to elaborate on your life now as a mom, the triumphs and the sleep deprivation and everything that comes with it? How has having Ella changed your life, both yourself and Joe's life? Uh, well, before Ella, Joe and I would, you know, we were homebodies. So, you know, it was work, it was study, it was home. We didn't have much of a routine outside of that. We kind of liked that, you know, little cozy time together. Uh, weekends was the same. We would go and do stuff. And, you know, it kind of got a bit bored, you know, like a bit boring because we were like, you know, married old couple and, you know, you're still young. So <laughs> we were like, no, I think something's going to change. And so we, you know, we were trying for, for quite some time and uh, we, you know, had some really um, trying times, like unsuccessful and and a few times where we did, you know, lose a few um, bubs. So you know, I think the last one before we got ELO was sort of that, you know, that sort of pivotal moment. And that's when, you know, we just said, let's just try one more time and, and see what happens. And and it just so happens that when I was down doing my MBA that um, Joe fell pregnant. So yeah. it yeah. was you know, kind of this time last year was when we were going through that process. So she yeah. had gone through those stages and you know we just kept in contact but I remember receiving that you know text in class and just trying not to you know <laughs> burst get, out get and, kind of you know jump out in the middle of the lecture and scare everyone <laughs> so, yeah I and remember so, that chat we had during lunchtime <laughs> remember at the food court and yeah. he said I'm gonna be a mom <laughs> yeah um, and we've had, you know, we've had some really great chats. I think, you know, the memorable one was, you know, during I think our first week and we had lunch and, you know, I shared some stuff that I didn't really, you know, thought I would share, but that was just how comfortable it was just, you know, sitting with you and having that yarn. And I was like, oh, like, you know, I walked away thinking, no, oh, she's really cool. Oh, you know, people. So, yeah, yeah. Likewise. Yeah. So he has, he's changed a, a lot of, um, a lot of what we do now, it's, you know, it's very routine, but I like it. I love washing bottles. I love doing his laundry. And so, you know, it's every day taking him out, discovering new things. So I'm seeing the world through his his eyes and his mm. development. And that's given me so much more of appreciation as well. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. So yeah. growing up in your community, not thinking that you were going to be a mom, uh, was a huge part of it due to the fact that you were gay or did you even know you were gay then like can you tell us a little bit more about that that uh that journey yeah so I I knew instantly uh within myself that I was gay when I was 15 mm. so growing up up until that time I was just very much a tomboy and all girls my cousins friends you know a lot of us were tomboys and so it wasn't really, you know, something you thought about. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't until I was 15 that I, you know, really knew something had changed and I, you know, had this kind of attraction and a feel that was more than just a phase. I guess it's, uh, that's kind of how I can explain it. Yeah. yeah. And so growing up, uh, we didn't have, I didn't have any people to look up to that were women that were gay. We had uh, one gay lady who lived in another community and she was really cool um, and that was kind of it and then I had some uncles who were gay but we knew they were gay but they weren't out in the community and so yep. or they didn't really express it that way um, yep. because of how sheltered you know the community is um, but they were really well loved and really well respected so mm. I think that part of my journey didn't sort of hit until I was in my mid twenties, mm. and that's when I came out to my family, um, mm. which was absolutely a scary time. And then the first time I came out to my family was with my nan, mm. and I actually got drunk the night before I told her coming out. So I thought that might be an easy way to do it, and then yeah. had the complete opposite reaction. She hugged me, told me she loved me, and she was still you know, I was still your auntie to her, so that mattered. And that gave me the confidence and to approach my family. 
I wrote letters to my brothers and my dad because I didn't know how to tell them. Mm. Uh, I had coffee with my mom and my sister at um, at a cafe in Cairns and I told them. Mm. And so they were sort of a bit blindsided because, you know, they didn't expect that. So yeah, um, but I do remember my mom walking away saying, you know, I think that explains a lot why you didn't bring a boy home. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think um, I think the part of, you know, becoming a mum or at that time not thinking I'd be a mum is because I just, I'm not really good with pain. Um, growing up, I've had, I've been in and out of hospitals. So I've always been in some sort of pain, whether it was concussion, uh, whether it was body. Um, and that's due to, you know, being sick as a child. I had mm. uh, pneumococcal meningitis when I was a baby and I almost, yeah, I almost um, died. And so as, you know, growing up, I always knew that I was going to be one of those that weren't weren't going to be a mum, but I would be surrounded by children and I would still love them. And those were my nieces and nephews. So I think a part of that, yeah, a part of that stems from my childhood illness, um, you know, a bit of trauma growing up, but then also just later in life, uh, not thinking that I would end up being mum, but also knowing there's different ways to be a mum. You can you can adopt. You can um, you don't have to give birth, but you can still be a part of the process. And and so being with Joe and seeing Joe carry Elo has changed my view of you know being a parent as well. Because growing up back home, it was always the women that gave birth. You would mm. be the mum. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that that changed. Uh, that changed my thinking as well. So you knew for sure that you were gay at age 15, but you didn't come out to your family until you're you're in your 20s. Yeah. Did you try to fight it or can you... Uh, tell us a little bit more about your journey between that 15 until you actually came out and tell the world this is who I am regardless of your acceptance or not yeah so um 15 is when I knew I think I came out uh 11 years later so that was when I was 26 that's when I officially came out and um sort of acknowledged to myself that was kind of the first step uh, saying that you know this is something I can't change it's innate um mm. and before that um so going back a few years a lot of those feelings started developing I think in my early 20s um so I think from about 20 21 up until 23 I was going through this period of just having um, really bad thoughts because I didn't know how to deal with it. It was really new. It, in a way, kind of blindsided me. But I think over the years, looking back, I kind of suppressed it. Yeah. And so for eleven years, I actually I suppressed it so much that within the few years of coming out, I actually almost you know nearly committed suicide because it. You know, it was something that I I didn't want. I was I prayed it away. I, you know, I tried everything to get rid of it, and it it wouldn't go. And so, I thought maybe, um, you know, in in such desperate you know need, I decided to just think, you know, maybe it's not worth having this feeling because so many. You know, I've read so many stories where people have been disowned and have, you know, there have been really bad things happen. And it sort of it got to a point where I just, I was like, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. And so, mm. um, you know, just, oh, yeah, I almost took my life. And yep. so that, that changed, that changed a lot of things when that happened. Yeah. Um, that moment is... I think probably one of the things I'll remember for the rest of my life because as I was sort of at that edge um, and that was like a physical edge, I was on a cliff and as I was about to take that next step, um, I had a flash, like a literal flash. 
and I saw my mom, like a, an, an image of my mom leaning over my coffin and she, you know, she was crying, she was grieving, but it was grieving at that time, but grieving for the, for the years to come that I wouldn't be there. And so seeing her and seeing that image and seeing my family, um, that actually pushed, that jolted me back physically. Mm. And I said, I can't, I can't do this to them. Mm. They almost lost me. My mom and dad almost lost me as a baby. And so I can't then choose to not be here. So mm. I decided at that moment that I would just kind of buck up. <laughs> so, and, and just, you know, go forward and, and, and just deal with it. See, see what happens. Cause it'll, it'll always be one or the other. And so that was, that was a risk I was willing to take to sort of be around for them. And mm. I'm glad that I did because it turned out to be, um, you know, so much the opposite that they had still loved me and still saw me as me. So didn't see me as Yanti, the gay person. They just still saw me as Yanti. Yeah. And so when I got to share that story with my mom. You know, she, uh, yeah, she she burst into tears and she said, "Well, I'm glad you're still here." So, yeah. Mm. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess your viewpoint of the world at that time was that gay equates to negative state of being, right? So you, you sort of related that with ill treatment from, from your family members, from your friends, you'll be um, ostracized and things like that. If you could uh, imagine a much better world from when you were 15 at that time, if if you could have all of the support um, that you could as a gay person how should life be in the ideal world do you think because it's not a negative state of being it's just a state of being right yeah exactly um I think if in in an ideal world if I did come out at 15 and had that support I think my life would have been really different now mm. um, in terms of just having you know that network at an early age particularly during your teens when you know you're still developing you're still figuring out who you are how you how you fit into this big world Mm. Um, and so that crucial that crucial time um, has given me a lot to think about now as a mum when Elo goes through this journey and just supporting him you know at every every turn as he as he's growing and getting older and being that support for him that I didn't get at that time. Yeah. And so um, and so for him, it's more about, I, I know for me, it's, you know, that time has come and gone, but I can, I can do everything now that I can yeah. within the power and the time that I have in this moment yeah. to, you know, to do something. Yeah. Um, and so that has channeled me to really focus on those pivotal um, development stages and to be that support no matter what he goes through. So I, I think that's, for me, that's been um, an eye-open sort of experience in, in that, yeah, in that respect. So um, there's there's not a lot that I can change, you know, mm. looking back, mm. but there is a lot that I can do now for ELO and yeah. so for me, that that's that's the most important thing is that he grows up with a holistic view of the world and to treat people as people, not not with color, not race, just see people mm-hmm. as people. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so for me, that's important. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So having role models that he can actually reach out to and speak to regarding any type of topics yeah so what about being a career person did you know back then when you were 15 that you were going to work on your job or career uh when I was 15 when I, I all I wanted to do was go to uni um I did. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew I had to. Uh, I knew I had to get out of the community and to see the bigger world. And going to university would open those doors. And so, I remember um, 
at the age of 16, my goal was to actually be a role model. That was it. That was my goal. When I was 16, I wrote that down. I said, I just want to be a positive role model for others in my community, whether I'm here or whether I'm outside. And so a part of writing that goal down was thinking of, you know, going to uni and doing something that I want to do. And so for a community kid like me, a bush kid, you know, that was that was never going to be an option. So um, so during school, we had lots of school trips, sporting trips. And with those sporting trips, you have a chance to actually do a tour of university. So I did James Cook when I was 16. And I thought that was kind of cool. I did um, University of Queensland. And so that got me thinking about, you know, um, life beyond school. And so yeah, at 15, at 16, I didn't know what I wanted to do except be a positive role model. So I thought going to university would be it. So, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. From back then, your mission was not, not if, if I understand you correctly, it's not so much about working in your own personal gain, but to give back to the community, right, by being that role model. Yeah. Yeah, growing up, I was surrounded by leaders who... Um, you know, they exemplify servant leadership, you know, no matter what position they're in, whether they were an uncle, whether they uh, were an elected leader uh, or they were heads of their family. Uh, my dad, my uncle, uh, his brothers, they, um, you know, they all taught me what it means, to, you know, what it means to give back to community, what servant leadership looked like. So I kind of, I was blessed enough to see that growing up, mm. that, you'd always give back to community and so that was instilled in me from a really young age and I think a part of uh, my culture so Angamwati culture is that you know your your elders you know they share with you they pass those knowledge on to you it's your responsibility to pass it on to the next generation and so you continue that storytelling um, you know through that process mm. and so with um, you know with my leaders with my elders it was, you know, it wasn't just a thing of you've got to do that. It was innate. It was natural. It was organic. So it was almost like what you learn, what you acquire, you you give back because you want to better your community. You want to better, uh, you want to better opportunities. You want to give those opportunities to others. And so, for me, uh, going through university through you know, through my studies, I'm always acquiring knowledge that I can give back and yeah. share. So that's whether working on projects or, you know, sitting and yarning with my aunties and my cousins, you know, I'm always giving back. I'm always sharing knowledge. And that's what we've always been as people and as a community. We're always sharing. We're always giving back. We're always bettering the whole community. And so I've been able to really see firsthand some of my elders and leaders do that. And some of them have led political lives where they've gone, you know, and fought for our land. And others have been quiet, like my dad. He's he's very much a quiet leader, but he knows how to, he's very strategic in what he does, but he's also very, um, you know, he's also very generous and very self selfless. And that's where I've learned to, you know, to have that as well. So for me, it's always, it's important to give back. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one part of that I really love about your culture in that you mentioned before as well, um, previously, how we call each other's aunt's moms. So you are taking that role of being the carer, just as being, you know, part of the community to begin with. Um, yeah. And the same with males as well, right? Um, yeah. And also having your family just open up their doors so anyone who needs it, everyone just more than welcome to come and help themselves, you know, um, for nourishment and even emotional nourishment. So that's really wonderful. Um, what what made you lead the uh, area of a librarian specifically? Is it the knowledge that you like to share with the world or your community as well and making sure that it it continues to get passed on? Yeah, well, actually, I kind of stumbled into the library um, space back in uh, 2015, and that's when I applied uh, to the National Library of Australia as an Indigenous graduate. 
And so I spent nine months going through their graduate program and learning everything within what the National Library does. And then that kind of opened up doors, you know, to, you know, which has led me to where I am now, um, working in an academic library in a university setting. Um, I've always loved libraries, you know, growing up, I was that bookworm kid that would, you know, spend their hour in the library, just, I went through the Encyclopedia Britannica, I went through, you know, all the world atlases, I went through <laughs> ancient history, <laughs> so I knew all about the Egyptians and the Greeks, you know, like the, the beautiful cultures and, and all the civilizations, <laughs> so, you know, and then I discovered, you know, animals and goosebumps, you know, as a young adult, you know, and so then that, <laughs> that hunger, you know, continued to where it is today, which is, um, you know, working in a library. So, yeah, I'm very passionate about, um, you know, working and looking at ways to build inclusive libraries. That's sort of my focus now. Yeah. Mm. So uh, obviously now you've just finished your MBA. You are yeah. a mom of a four four month old. What is yes. life be like right now? Uh, early mornings, <laughs> a lot of structured routine, uh, a lot of washing, changing nappies, <laughs> uh, washing up bottles, <laughs> and you know having playtime, learning you know learning to rediscover the world through Elo's eyes and working you know working as a librarian but also looking at um pursuing other passions i love teaching and so i've been up you know i've been offered an opportunity to teach so i'm looking forward to that that's you know the next step is always progressing and and doing things to challenge myself career-wise but also supporting you know my wife who's actually gone back to studying so she's going to be she's studying to be a nurse and a midwife well actually a midwife so supporting her through you know this next couple of years of her studies so for me it's just taking a step back and supporting her and and just spending time with with Elo and and see what else is on the horizon so you never know I might do another master's degree <laughs> <laughs> in Canada uh, apparently so looking forward yeah. to it yeah, I might end up in Vancouver again. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So four months, I remember the the fourth trimester as being a huge blur because it was just a constant sleep deprivation, uh, a lot of routine, a lot of repetition of the same things. How yeah. have you been able to maintain that connection with Joe? Um, I think every day we just, you know, we just take time to spend you know with each other and yeah she she's phenomenal she actually lets me sleep so I get it I get a few more hours of sleep every week um and so but now that she's gone back to to uni it's just it's the same just waking up helping her in the middle of the night getting the bottles ready um and so you know we try and we try and and I guess what I see, we just talk about, you know, things that are that are happening, what we want to do. We still maintain that um, communication regardless of, you know, yeah, a little four-month-old that takes up all your time. So, yeah, yeah, we make sure that we do go out as a family on the weekends, like we do things as a family, but we also, um, we know that we'll be able to kind of, you know, get back to us being a couple as well, you know, down the track when, Elo is a little bit older so for us right now we're just enjoying our time with him enjoying each other and you know just seeing what an amazing mum you know she is and so attentive and that makes me you know want to be a great mum as well so yeah. yeah so it's just talking we do a lot of uh family breakfasts which has been really good and that that gives us time to just connect and talk as well yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. I saw you um, embarked on a one one year long distance relationship with Joe when you were completing your MBA, and you maintained that communication. And when she came to visit, you sort of you know you complete each other's thoughts. It's yeah. really <laughs> surreal. It's um it's it's good to see that you still have that connection. You know, even with the sleep deprivation and the um 
uh, the four four month old that overtakes most of your life and time. So that's good. So if you could give yourself, your younger self, one advice, say, let's go back to that younger Yanti who was 15 years old and um, you started to question your life and your place in it. Knowing all of the wealth of wisdom that you know now, what one advice would you share with the younger Yanti? You, you can do it. You, you're determined. You're resilient. Um, you know you know you so take it one day at a time and know that everything will work out and everything will be okay yeah that's awesome yeah. great and uh one question that i always ask all moms is do you have an <laughs> alpha mom song alpha mom song oh no <laughs> <laughs> Well, at the moment, it's been, um, uh, I've been listening to, yeah, there is one, um, I'm a big fan of RuPaul's Drag Race, and he just released this awesome song called Bring Back My Girls, and just okay. has wicked funky beat, so yeah. I've just been listening to that, and that's kind of been my jive at the moment. Yeah, okay, yeah. awesome. So. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so yeah. much for being here, my sister, I really enjoyed our thank conversation. You, yeah, thank you. I hope so we much. can see each other. Well, I we will see each other again soon. Graduation. I'm really looking forward to that. Yes, I can't wait to see you. Okay. Enjoy your travels. Thank you. Please send my uh, hug to Joe in Ilo. Yeah. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Breadwinning Mums. Please subscribe and leave us some feedback so we can continue to make the show better for you. If you know a fellow Breadwinning Mum, please share the show so we can cheer each other on. Until next time. Thank you.